8. The Seeing Eye First published in the American Periodical Show, Volume 3, February 1963, the editor entitled it Onward Christian Spaceman, a title which Lewis so disliked that it was renamed for publication in Christian Reflections, 1998. The Russians, I am told, report that they have not found God in outer space. On the other hand, a good many people in many different times and countries claim to have found God or been found by God here on earth. The conclusion some want us to draw from these data is that God does not exist. As a corollary, those who think they have met him on earth were suffering from a delusion. But other conclusions might be drawn. 1. We have not yet gone far enough in space. There had been ships on the Atlantic for a good time before America was discovered. 2. God does exist, but is locally confined to this planet. 3. The Russians did find God in space without knowing it, because they lacked the requisite apparatus for detecting him. 4. God does exist, but is not an object either located in a particular part of space, nor diffused, as we once thought ether was, throughout space. The first two conclusions do not interest me. The sort of religion for which they could be a defence would be a religion for savages, the belief in a local deity who can be contained in a particular temple, island or grove. That, in fact, seems to be the sort of religion about which the Russians, or some Russians and a good many people in the West, are being irreligious. It is not in the least disquieting that no astronauts have discovered a god of that sort. The really disquieting thing would be if they had. The third and fourth conclusions are the ones for my money. Looking for God, or heaven, by exploring space, is like reading or seeing all Shakespeare's plays in the hope that you will find Shakespeare as one of the characters, or Stratford as one of the places. Shakespeare is in one sense present at every moment in every play but he is never present in the same way as Falstaff or Lady Macbeth, nor is he diffused through the play like a gas. If there were an idiot who thought plays existed on their own without an author, not to mention actors, producer, manager, stagehands and what not, our belief in Shakespeare would not be much affected by his saying, quite truly, that he had studied all the plays and never found Shakespeare in them. The rest of us, in varying degrees, according to our perceptiveness, found Shakespeare in the plays. But it is a quite different sort of finding from anything our poor friend has in mind. Even he has, in reality, been in some way affected by Shakespeare, but without knowing it. He lacked the necessary apparatus for detecting Shakespeare. And now, of course, this is only an analogy. I am not suggesting at all that the existence of God is as easily established as the existence of Shakespeare. And my point is that, if God does exist, he is related to the universe more as an author is related to a play than as one object in the universe is related to another. If God created the universe, he created space-time, which is to the universe as the meter is to a poem, or the key is to music. To look for him as one item within the framework which he himself invented is nonsensical. If God, such a God as any adult religion believes in, exists, mere movement in space will never bring you any nearer to him or any farther from him than you are at this very moment. You can neither reach him nor avoid him by travelling to Alpha Centauri or even to other galaxies. A fish is no more and no less in the sea after it has swum a thousand miles than it was when it set out. How then, it may be asked, can we either reach or avoid him? The avoiding, in many times and places, has proved so difficult that a very large part of the human race failed to achieve it. But in our own time and place it is extremely easy. Avoid silence, avoid solitude, avoid any train of thought that leads off the beaten track. Concentrate on money, sex, status, health, and, above all, on your own grievances. Keep the radio on, live in a crowd, use plenty of sedation. If you must read books, select them very carefully. But you'd be safer to stick to the papers. You'll find the advertisements helpful, especially those with a sexy or a snobbish appeal. About the reaching, I am a far less reliable guide. That is because I never had the experience of looking for God. It was the other way round. He was the hunter, 
or so it seemed to me, and I was the deer. He stalked me like a redskin, took unerring aim, and fired. And I am very thankful that that is how the first conscious meeting occurred. It forearms one against subsequent fears that the whole thing was only wish-fulfillment. Something one didn't wish for can hardly be that. But it is significant that this long-evaded encounter happened at a time when I was making a serious effort to obey my conscience. No doubt it was far less serious than I supposed, but it was the most serious I had made for a long time. One of the first results of such an effort is to bring your picture of yourself down to something near a life-size, and presently you begin to wonder whether you are yet, in any full sense, a person at all, whether you are entitled to call yourself I. It is a sacred name. In that way, the process is like being psychoanalyzed, only cheaper. I mean in dollars. In some other ways, it may be more costly. You find that what you called yourself is only a thin film on the surface of an unsounded and dangerous sea. But not merely dangerous. Radiant things, delights and inspirations come to the surface, as well as snarling resentments and nagging lusts. One's ordinary self is, then, a mere façade. There's a huge area out of sight behind it. And then, if one listens to the physicists, one discovers that the same is true of all things around us. These tables and chairs, this magazine, the trees, clouds and mountains are façades. Poke, scientifically, into them, and you find the unimaginable structure of the atom. That is, in the long run, you find mathematical formulas. There are you, whatever you means, sitting reading. Out there, whatever there means, is a white page with black marks on it. And both are facades. Behind both lies, well, whatever it is. The psychologists and the theologians, though they use different symbols, equally use symbols when they try to probe the depth behind the facade called you. That is, they can't really say, it is this but they can say, it is in some way like this. And the physicists, trying to probe behind the other façade, can give you only mathematics. And the mathematics may be true about the reality, but it can hardly be the reality itself, any more than contour lines are real mountains. I am not in the least blaming either set of experts for this state of affairs. They make progress. They are always discovering things. If governments make a bad use of the physicists' discoveries, or if novelists and biographers make a bad use of the psychologists' discoveries, the experts are not to blame. The point, however, is that every fresh discovery, far from dissipating, deepens the mystery. Presently, if you are a person of a certain sort, if you are one who has to believe that all things which exist must have unity, it will seem to you irresistibly probable that what lies ultimately behind the one façade also lies ultimately behind the other. And then, again, if you are that sort of person, you may come to be convinced that your contact with that mystery in the area you call yourself is a good deal closer than your contact through what you call matter. For in the one case I, the ordinary, conscious I, am continuous with the unknown depths. And after that, you may come, some do, to believe that that voice, like all the rest I must speak symbolically, that voice which speaks in your conscience and in some of your intensest joys, which is sometimes so obstinately silent, sometimes so easily silenced, and then at other times so loud and emphatic, is in fact the closest contact you have with the mystery, and therefore finally to be trusted, obeyed, feared, and desired more than all other things. But still, if you are a different sort of person, you will not come to this conclusion. I hope everyone sees how this is related to the astronautical question from which we started. The process I have been sketching may equally well occur, or fail to occur, wherever you happen to be. I don't mean that all religious and all irreligious people have either taken this step or refused to take it. Once religion and its opposite are in the world, and they have both been in it for a very long time, the majority in both camps will be simply conformists. Their belief or disbelief will result from their upbringing and from the prevailing tone of the circles they live in. They will have done no hunting for God and no flying for God on their own. 
but if no minorities who did these things on their own existed, I presume that the conforming majorities would not exist either. Don't imagine I'm despising these majorities. I am sure the one contains better Christians than I am, the other nobler atheists than I was. Space travel really has nothing to do with the matter. To some, God is discoverable everywhere, to others, nowhere. Those who do not find him on earth are unlikely to find him in space. Hang it all, we're in space already. Every year we go a huge circular tour in space. But send a saint up in a spaceship and he'll find God in space as he found God on earth. Much depends on the seeing eye. And this is especially confirmed by my own religion, which is Christianity. When I said a while ago that it was nonsensical to look for God as one item within his own work, the universe, some readers may have wanted to protest. They wanted to say, but surely, according to Christianity, that is just what did once happen. Surely the central doctrine is that God became man and walked about among other men in Palestine. If that is not appearing as an item in his own work, what is it? The objection is much to the point. To meet it, I must readjust my old analogy of the play. One might imagine a play in which the dramatist introduced himself as a character into his own play and was pelted off the stage as an impudent impostor by the other characters. It might be rather a good play. If I had any talent for the theatre, I'd try my hand at writing it. But since, as far as I know, such a play doesn't exist, we had better change to a narrative work, a story into which the author puts himself as one of the characters. We have a real instance of this in Dante's Divine Comedy. Dante is, one, the muse outside the poem who is inventing the whole thing, and, two, a character inside the poem whom the other characters meet and with whom they hold conversations. Where the analogy breaks down is that everything the poem contains is merely imaginary, in that the characters have no free will. They, the characters, can say to Dante only what Dante, the poet, has decided to put into their mouths. I do not think we humans are related to God in that way. I think God can make things which not only, like a poet's or novelist's characters, seem to have a partially independent life, but really have it. But the analogy furnishes a crude model of the Incarnation in two respects. One, Dante the poet and Dante the character are in a sense one, but in another sense two. This is a faint and far-off suggestion of what theologians mean by the union of the two natures, divine and human, in Christ. Two, the other people in the poem meet and see and hear Dante, but they have not even the faintest suspicion that he is making the whole world in which they exist and has a life of his own outside it, independent of it. It is the second point which is most relevant. For the Christian story is that Christ was perceived to be God by very few people indeed, perhaps for a time only by St. Peter, who would also, and for the same reason, have found God in space. For Christ said to Peter, Flesh and blood have not taught you this. The methods of science do not discover facts of that order. Indeed, the expectation of finding God by astronautics would be very like trying to verify or falsify the divinity of Christ by taking specimens of his blood or dissecting him. And in their own way they did both, but they were no wiser than before. What is required is a certain faculty of recognition. If you do not at all know God, of course you will not recognize him, either in Jesus or in outer space. The fact that we have not found God in space does not then bother me in the least, nor am I much concerned about the space race between America and Russia. The more money, time, skill and zeal they both spend on that rivalry, the less, we may hope, they will have to spend on armaments. Great powers might be more usefully, but are seldom less dangerously, employed than in fabricating costly objects and flinging them, as you might say, overboard. Good luck to it. It is an excellent way of letting off steam. But there are three ways in which space travel will bother me if it reaches the stage for which most people are hoping. The first is merely sentimental, or perhaps aesthetic. No moonlit night will ever be the same to me again if, as I look up at that pale disk, I must think, yes, up there to the left is the Russian area, and over there to the right is the American bit, and up at the top is the place which is now threatening to produce a crisis. 
The immemorial moon, the moon of the myth, the poets, the lovers, will have been taken from us forever. Part of our mind, a huge mass of our emotional wealth, will have gone. Artemis, Diana, the silver planet belonged in that fashion to all humanity. He who first reaches it steals something from us all. Secondly, a more practical issue will arise when, if ever, we discover rational creatures on other planets. I think myself this is a very remote contingency. The balance of probability is against life on any other planet of the solar system. We shall hardly find it nearer than the stars. And even if we reach the moon, we shall be no nearer to stellar travel than the first man who paddled across a river was to crossing the Pacific. This thought is welcome to me because, to be frank, I have no pleasure in looking forward to a meeting between humanity and any alien rational species. I observe how the white man has hitherto treated the black, and how, even among civilized men, the stronger have treated the weaker. If we encounter in the depth of space a race, however innocent and amiable, which is technologically weaker than ourselves, I do not doubt that the same revolting story will be repeated. We shall enslave, deceive, exploit, or exterminate. At the very least we shall corrupt it with our vices and infect it with our diseases. We are not yet fit to visit other worlds. We have filled our own with massacre, torture, syphilis, famine, dust bowls, and with all that is hideous to ear or eye. Must we go on to infect new realms? Of course, we might find a species stronger than ourselves. In that case we shall have met, if not God, at least God's judgment in space. But once more the detecting apparatus will be inadequate. We shall think it just our bad luck if righteous creatures rightly destroy those who come to reduce them to misery. It was in part these reflections that first moved me to make my own small contributions to science fiction. In those days, writers in that genre almost automatically represented the inhabitants of other worlds as monsters and the terrestrial invaders as good. Since then, the opposite setup has become fairly common. If I could believe that I had, in any degree, contributed to this change, I should be a proud man. The same problem, by the way, is beginning to threaten us as regards the dolphins. I don't think it has yet been proved that they are rational, but if they are, we have no more right to enslave them than to enslave our fellow men. And some of us will continue to say this, but we shall be mocked. The third thing is this. Some people are troubled, and others are delighted at the idea of finding not one, but perhaps innumerable rational species scattered about the universe. In both cases, the emotion arises from a belief that such discoveries would be fatal to Christian theology, for it will be said that theology connects the incarnation of God with the fall and redemption of man, and this would seem to attribute to our species and to our little planet a central position in cosmic history which is not credible, if rationally inhabited planets are to be had by the million. Older readers will, with me, notice the vast change in astronomical speculation which this view involves. When we were boys, all astronomers, so far as I know, impressed upon us the antecedent improbabilities of life in any part of the universe whatever. It was not thought unlikely that this earth was the solitary exception to a universal reign of the inorganic. Now Professor Hoyle, and many with him, say that in so vast a universe life must have occurred in times and places without number. The interesting thing is that I have heard both these estimates used as arguments against Christianity. And now it seems to me that we must find out more than we can at present know, which is nothing, about hypothetical rational species before we can say what theological corollaries or difficulties their discovery would raise. We might, for example, find a race which was, like us, rational, but unlike us, innocent, no wars nor any other wickedness among them, all peace and good fellowship. I don't think any Christian would be puzzled to find out they knew no story of an incarnation or redemption, and might even find our story hard to understand or accept if we told it to them. There would have been no redemption in such a world because it would not have needed redeeming. They that are whole need not the physician. The sheep that has never strayed need not be sought for. We should have much to learn from such people and nothing to teach them. If we were wise, we should fall at their feet. 
but probably we should be unable to take it. We'd find some reason for exterminating them. Again, we might find a race which, like ours, contained both good and bad. And we might find that for them, as for us, something had been done that at some point in their history some great interference for the better, believed by some of them to be supernatural, had been recorded, and that its effects, though often impeded and perverted, were still alive among them. It need not, as far as I can see, have conformed to the pattern of incarnation, passion, death, and resurrection. God may have other ways. How should I be able to imagine them of redeeming a lost world? and redemption in that alien mode might not be easily recognizable by our missionaries, let alone by our atheists. We might meet a species which, like us, needed redemption but had not been given it. But would this fundamentally be more of a difficulty than any Christian's first meeting with a new tribe of savages? It would be our duty to preach the gospel to them, for if they are rational, capable both of sin and repentance, they are our brethren, whatever they look like. Would this spreading of the gospel from earth through man imply a preeminence for earth and man? Not in any real sense. If a thing is to begin at all, it must begin at some particular time and place. And any time and place raises the question, why just then and just there? One can conceive an extraterrestrial development of Christianity so brilliant that earth's place in the story might sink to that of a prologue. Finally, we might find a race which was strictly diabolical, no tiniest spark felt in them from which any goodness could ever be coaxed into the feeblest glow, all of them incurably perverted through and through. What then? We Christians had always been told that there were creatures like that in existence. True, we thought they were all incorporeal spirits. A minor readjustment thus becomes necessary. But all this is in the realm of fantastic speculation. We are trying to cross a bridge not only before we come to it, but even before we know there is a river that needs bridging. 